many times what is happening at the heart of racism are people not merely denying other people's dignity and humanity, but denying their very own dignity and humanity. Today on Chalk Radio, an innovative approach to teaching about race and racism. It means, you know, pulling back and asking some tough questions about our society, about ourselves, about what it takes to move forward, understanding each other, but also working to advance a much more just society and a much better way of understanding what it means to coexist. In this episode, an urban studies course examines our lives in public spaces and invites us to consider how our very personal experiences might also contain the experiences of others. In our conversation about his course, 11S947, The Fire This Time, Race and Racism in American Cities, visiting scholar and acclaimed essayist Garnett Cadigan shares his approach for helping students wrestle with, as he puts it, the story of racism in the United States. Part of what I love about Garnett's approach is how he weaves his own life experiences into his teaching. A large focus of his life and work has been observing cities through a unique modality, walking. It's such a human pace that allows us to inscribe ourselves onto the world and allow the world to inscribe itself onto our imagination. But more than anything else, it's a marvelously joyful way of getting to know the world, of getting to know it up close, not merely getting to know it, but getting to know ourselves through the kind of surprising encounters we might have. So one of the things I love most about walking is the way in which it opens us up to serendipity. So walking as a way of knowing the world, as a way of knowing ourselves, and as a way of being open to the surprise and serendipities of the world. Garnett grew up in Jamaica, where he learned to navigate public spaces on foot. In Jamaica, as I walked, I walked a lot at night after public transportation had stopped running and would navigate from friends' homes to my home and pass through some very dangerous neighborhoods and learned how to be streetwise, as in you know, the wisdom gained from constant observation and being able to anticipate dangers or sometimes encountering true dangers and knowing how to get away from dangers. And I thought that's all you needed to do to be you know, navigating in public space and to be safe, to anticipate the dangers and veer away from them. When he arrived in the United States as a college student, his experiences with racism began to shape the way he traversed city streets. And I came to the U.S. with that sensibility and then began encountering racism, but recognized that what actually happened then, it wasn't so much learning how to read a danger, but learning to read in places in which people thought I was a danger. That's what had happened, that you know, it was over and over again, me seeing the dangers and veering away from it, but then suddenly recognizing and being shocked to know that I was a danger, and I was a danger because I was black, because of my skin color. So navigating then suddenly became trying to anticipate the ways in which people would anticipate me being dangerous. It meant calibrating my movements, not to fear, but calibrating my movements to people's fear of me and knowing that that could be dangerous for me, that it could mean anything from them attacking me, which had happened, or threatening to attack me, you know, or them calling the police, who would then give me a tough time. I'm able to many times deal with the awfulness that the world throws at me because of the beauty that the world also presents, that the world is never just one thing. And so, yes, there are people who will shout you know, awful racist things to me on the street, but there's also that stranger who says, oh, I'm going to a barbecue. You know, it looks like you're just wandering and looking for something to do. You want to come along with us? And so that's the, that's the very same world. The very same world. There was something so powerful in that idea. 
And I began to wonder how this outlook shaped Garnett's teaching in the classroom, how he approached the ideas of race and racism with students with this outlook in mind. I focus very much in, in the classroom you know, on joy and the way in which joy, joy becomes in so many ways, both a hope and the way joy is wed to hope, but the way joy is also read, you know, wed to resistance, you know, the way joy is wed to our ability to deal with these things and to push past these things. So as a teacher, I time and again try to invite students to read the way I walk it becomes a way of having a conversation, in a, a conversation with the past, a conversation with the present, a conversation with people nearby, a conversation with people who are far away. And more than anything, it's a conversation with yourself, a way of resting with yourself. And that in the end, or, or that's my hope, in a, in a different self in a, can emerge, a different, better self, much more of the discovery and encounter. For Garnett, encountering others is key to understanding the story of racism in American cities and for imagining a different, much more dignified way to coexist. It's an idea that grounds how he teaches about these complexities. What does it mean to think of the classroom as a place of encounter in which you're continually encountering these issues, these histories, these landscapes, these complexities, these people. And what does it mean to truly listen, to truly understand? Garnett shared with me that it can feel disheartening to unpack the complexities of racism in our society. Students and teachers alike may experience burnout over the course of a semester. As I talked with Garnett, it struck me that helping students cultivate curiosity about themselves and others was a strategic way to sustain their engagement. When you have something so huge, it's to say, oh, we're just going to climb this mountain right away. Um, it's, it's just impossible that your legs will give out you know, quite quickly and it will just lead to frustration. So I invite them to just take a small patch and to you know, keep moving patch by patch you know, on that mountain until at a certain point they look up and they go, oh, we're halfway up and we're actually not even trying to conquer the mountain anymore. That was the wrong way to, to, to go about it. You know, we're just now at a place in which we're happy to investigate the terrain and then the axe, each other, what the terrain looks like, where you are, so I could learn more about the mountain. And we might actually not even reach the top, but we'll have a much better understanding of landscape and of flora and fauna and of nature and much better sense of what it means to hike thoughtfully. As an essayist, Garnett brings an innovative slant to teaching about race and racism. For him, the act of writing and having students write is a way to do the work of encountering others. Writing is sometimes just merely a way of raising questions rather than giving answers. Particularly in issues connected with race and racism in cities, that's a big order. It's a lifetime you know, of thinking and wrestling with complicated issues. Racism, race, which is produced by racism, and American cities. What does it take to understand and to wrestle you know, with the you know, full you know, scope you know, and the complications connected you know, with each of these and the writing becomes a way sometimes just merely to ask questions to say, oh, we have not been asking the right questions. This invites us to ask new questions. Or this invites us to see in new ways. This invites us to listen. And more than anything, it invites us to encounter, to encounter each other in conversation, but also to encounter others on the page. It means, you know, pulling back and asking some tough questions about our society, about ourselves, about what it takes to move forward, understanding each other, but also working to advance a much more just society and a much better way of understanding what it means to coexist, what it means to live together alongside each other. And the writing becomes a way to explore that. So as they're writing, they're suddenly recognizing that the whole world is their material and they're invited to, to think just expansively and to start recognizing the ways in which they haven't been seen, the ways in which they haven't been looking. 
they're beginning to ask, what might it mean to listen to the people who are doing harm? Listen to the people who have experienced harm and to listen you know, more fully and broadly. As my conversation with Garnett continued, it became clear that for him, listening more fully means tuning into how people navigate the world in nuanced ways. It means writing about how they encounter harm, but also how they cultivate joy and hope in community. There is a temptation to write about people who have experienced racism as this is some total of what has happened to them. So they're you know, merely victims with no agency. And they're then invited to go beyond that by suddenly asking, what are the ways in which they experience joy? What are the ways in which they hope? What are the ways in which they work towards creating a sense of belonging for themselves and others? What are the tight bonds of community and family and country for the people that we're writing about? And what are the ways in which these are broken or you know, erupted or eroded? And you're not suddenly speaking of people in a condescending or paternalistic matter. You're speaking of people as fully rounded, you know, not no longer flattened, but you're seeing them in, in rich dimension with aspirations and joys and frustrations and faults and virtues. Even when writing about people as fully rounded individuals, students may encounter challenges when learning to write about race. Garnett elaborated on one of the complexities many writers face. One of the problems with speaking about and writing about race is that too often people are made to feel that their responsibilities are to explain one side to another side. To explain the black experience to people who are not black or to explain what it means to inhabit a particular body and set up experiences that are unique to you and that make moving through or living in the world a much worse experience than someone with a different skin color. But part of the challenge is to show the ways in which racism degrades everyone. That in degrading someone else, you can't help but degrade yourself. And in that class, one of the things I'm trying to invite people to do, I'm trying to invite students to think about, is the responsibilities, not merely to think of writing about race or understanding race, of trying to show you know, one set of experiences to someone who's foreign to it, but to show the ways in which we have quite a bit of common experiences and that many times what is happening at the heart of racism are people not merely denying other people's dignity and humanity, but denying their very own dignity and humanity. And so it's an invitation to figure out you know, how to write about race and racism in which we're showing the ways in which we contain each other. So I keep giving them you know, multiple small exercises in which time and time again they begin with themselves and they begin by saying, how do I see? Or even to write that I want them to think about multiple voices. What does it mean to think of writing as not just merely speaking, but as a way of integrating your voice with the voice of others? What are other people's ways of telling your stories? And how can you tell a story about them, you know, your understanding of their story, but in a way that you know, fully honors them telling their own story. And that seems like such a huge task for people. And so I begin by saying, oh, let's play critical karaoke. Garnet adapted this practice from a music conference he attended, where attendees got to speak about a song as the song played. I sat in on one of his classes and observed critical karaoke in action. It was one of the most powerful teaching methods I've seen yet for capturing how we contain each other. They begin by starting to say, this is what the song is about, or this is why it relates to this particular issue, or my thinking on this issue. And you're hearing them speak about the song, but tying the song to a larger issue that they're thinking about. And then speaking about lyrics of the song or something the song does, 
and at that point their voice fades out and you hear the song the song's notes or the song's lyrics come in and it teaches them in a fun way you know how to begin to think about interweaving my voice with the voice of others how to speak alongside others rather than about others in which you're speaking about them denies them agency and dignity Critical karaoke is one example of how Garnet is rethinking how we engage students in learning about racism. But there's something even more profound at work in his teaching. He's fundamentally reimagining a framework for how we approach the topic with students, veering off a well-trod sequential strategy and jumping into a mind-opening matrix of connections. I looked at a lot of syllabuses. I went online and try to find every syllabus I could find that was available at different universities about race and racism in America, particularly in American cities. And the approach tends to be to have it organized by issue. This week we will discuss slavery, or these weeks we will discuss slavery, then emancipation, the civil rights movement, mass incarceration, policing, education, environmental injustice, in a housing, in a development, education. And I found what actually happened was that when I began discussing by way of issues, then people in a, in a so often organized around issues and then they felt like they had to resolve it in a, at that moment. So he decided to shift the focus. It became on inequality, on freedom on joy, on pessimism and hope, on belonging, on mythology, on unrest, on violence, on resistance, on imagination. It was an invitation to say, we will not figure out mass incarceration in one week. That it became a way of spreading the issues out. And so mass incarceration would come up when we're talking about inequality. And then it would return again when we're talking about hope and pessimism. And then it would return again when we're talking about resistance. And they then had the invitation to, you know, have spent a whole semester to think through this thing. They then suddenly recognized the ways in which we thought we were all bound up in each other. The issues themselves were all bound up in each other. As you began to think about, you know, issues having to do with mass incarceration, you were also thinking about issues having to do with policing, you were thinking about issues having to do with housing, you were thinking about education, you were thinking about investment and disinvestment. And suddenly, instead of in a, in a teleological line, which is so often how we talk about race and what I recognize with also the syllabuses, it's in, in, it's, in a moving from unfreedom to freedom with occasional hiccups, that was the wrong way to think about it, rather than a matrix in which everything was deeply connected to the other. Garnett views the act of creating his syllabus as being very similar to writing the narrative of a story. One thing I do with the syllabus is that I make the syllabus a story in and of itself. That too often syllabuses are schematic, that they're almost disconnected rooms in a house, or they're treated like rooms in this mansion, that there's like a side where you can go from one to the other. And I think of the syllabus as like one big hall. And in that in a big hall where different gatherings you can go and then you can come back and so you don't leave one room and you never return and so i treat the syllabus like a full story and so there are songs we will hear and then we hear them again later on in a, in a different context there are poems that we will read and we read them again later on you know or there is one particular article they'll read on the second week and then we read it again on the seventh week which seems unusual and they're like what didn't we read this again and they, they suddenly read it with new eyes and it becomes a way of seeing you know, it as a story. And then I think of things as late motifs to say, we will begin discussing this, but then we will stop here. And so they get a taste of it and it comes back more full blown later on. And so I think of it as a particular narrative arc. So I treat the semester itself like a narrative arc. For Garnet, the syllabus must be as multidimensional as the students themselves, incorporating opportunities for joy and reflection and it should also be shaped by the students' voices. Every week, they encounter stand-up comedy. 
uh, they encounter poetry, they encounter song, they encounter film, they encounter short story, you know, fiction, essay, reportage, the academic article. And so there are a variety of voices and it's an invitation to understand the world in the many ways the world presents itself to you in knowledge. One of the fascinating things about teaching a course like this is you know, how do you keep yourself open to being taught by the students? In thinking about this balancing of many voices, in the voices from the past or voices near and far, in it, can you in a, in a accommodate their voices? And so in a class like this, one has to be very open and you know, ready to listen and to have students express their own autonomy and shape in it. And part of, you know, because there's also a great irony in not doing that, because one of the things at the heart of racism is the denial of autonomy to others. The ways in which many times, you know, authorities use to stamp on autonomy. And for me, not to listen, not to have them be active agents in shaping and reshaping the class would then be a version of that, of you know, authority denying autonomy. To close, I'd like to leave you with a quote from Garnett about joy and resilience. One of the things I had made a decision very early was that I am not the sum total of what happens to me, which is something I you know, keep reminding students you know, as they study about race and racism, that people are more than the sum total of the awful things that have happened to them that there's a possibility you know, of joy, of resistance, you know, of moving through the world, not ignoring the awful things that have happened to you, but of determining that you will not let you know, these awful things define and constrain you. If you're ready to learn more about writing and teaching about race and racism and unpacking the story of the American city, You'll soon be able to find Garnett Cadigan's teaching materials on our MIT OpenCourseWare website. Our materials are always free. If you're an educator who remixes the resources in your own teaching, please call or write to us to share your story. You'll help inspire others. Thank you so much for listening. Signing off from Cambridge, Massachusetts, I'm Sarah Hansen from MIT OpenCourseWare.